immoral or lazy or promiscuous. Um, instead, oh, sorry about that. Uh, instead, I want to spend this talk thinking about the fact that clothes on screen are real clothes worn by actors. And as a result of this, they have a real materiality. In fact, enlarged on a big screen, films present audiences with an almost hyper real version of the materiality of their own clothes. And I want to argue that this material experience of going to the cinema acts as a powerful form of emotional communication between audiences and filmmakers. Now, in order to explore this idea and to ask a little bit about what we can learn about the history of emotions through studying film costume, I'm going to zoom in on the middle decades of the 20th century with a particular focus on the costumes of some of the films produced by Ealing Studios in the aftermath of the Second World War. And I'm going to discuss how audiences might have understood the moral and class connotations of the fashions they saw in these films through the own experiences of, of making and buying and wearing clothes. And through this, I'll ask a bit about how the clothes that we can see in these films can help us understand the complex and often quite contradictory emotions that people had during this period. Um, and remember, this is a period of time when conflict and global geopolitics disrupted pretty much every aspect of daily life. But first, I want to think a little bit more broadly about the role of costumes in film in the middle decades of the 20th century. In the 1920s, film producers in the fashion industry began to embrace the role of fashion on screen um, as a tool to both sell clothes in shops and also to sell tickets to the movies. As Samuel Goldwyn, who ran United Artists in the 1920s put it, women went to the movies to see how other women dressed. And this mutually beneficial commercial relationship can clearly be seen in the pages of the new film fan magazine such as Photoplay and Picture Goer, which included features about star style. And it can also be seen in the invites that Parisian couturiers received to design Hollywood costumes, uh, including the very lucrative million dollar deal that Sam Goldwyn offered Coco Chanel in 1930 to come to Hollywood twice a year to dress his stars both on screen and off. And in the race to grab press attention, Hollywood film costumes became increasingly spectacular in the 1930s. With eye-grabbing visual impact, prized above concerns about depicting realistic interpretations of historical or contemporary events. And I think the, the 1939 David O. Selznick film, Gone with the Wind, provides a really good example of this. So as part of the research process, the costume designer, Walter Plunkett, who's pictured here, sent a team on a tour of the South, speaking to women who'd been alive during the Civil War about their wardrobes and visiting private collections of Civil War era clothes stashed in people's attics. They did this really quite detailed in-depth research. Um, however, when we look now at correspondence between the producer David O'Selznick and the costume team, um, we see that when the researchers who'd gone out and done this detailed historical research expressed concern when they saw Walter Plunkett's costume designs that these designs dressed the women much too nicely for Atlanta of that day, they were told by the producer to disregard authenticity and take license with respect to the general beauty of the picture. And I think the, the results of this approach can really be seen in the finished costumes, um, including this one, which is the, the famous and really quite visually arresting curtain dress worn by Vivian Lee in the role of Scarlett O'Hara. Um, and it's one of those pieces that uh, 
really leaves you a bit starstruck when you see it in person. Um, so I just wanted to include a little bit of a close up to demonstrate really quite how mad this costume is. Um, so this is the hat uh, from the costume. And you can see that it, it features a really large amount of furniture braid, um, this amazing draped velvet that's quite architectural, um, and these very vivid feathers. Um, but perhaps weirdest of all, it features these gold painted chicken's claws. Um, now I'm not really sure if bits of gilded animal carcass strictly count as dressing too nicely for Atlanta, um, but I think it certainly demonstrates the extent to which artistic license won out against realism in this particular Hollywood blockbuster. However, while the costumes for films like Gone with the Wind and other big budget Hollywood films certainly succeeded in their aims to generate publicity and draw crowds, they weren't always well received by British audiences. In fact, as a 1937 mass observation survey of cinema goers in Bolton reveals, many people actively resented the unnatural and unrealistic fantasy of the world that they saw portrayed on screen in Hollywood films. Instead, craving content that resembled their real lives and experiences a bit more closely. By the end of the 1930s, it seems that Hollywood films had become just too unrelatably spectacular for many British audiences. And this sense of, of distance and disinterest in Hollywood fantasy was only compounded further by the hardship of life on the home front during the Second World War. Um, and we can see this growing irritation and resentment um, with Hollywood spectacle uh, evidenced in the mockery that many British film fan magazines made of Hollywood publicity and promotion in the late 1940s and early 1950s. And I think you can see that really nicely here um, from this caption under a pin-up style photo of Gloria de Haven in the British film fan magazine Picture Goer, um, which cast doubt on the, the practicality of her bathing outfit, uh, questioning whether she ever actually dived off the deep end in that swimsuit. So it's kind of mocking how ridiculous the pretense um, that this is uh, a bathing outfit she'd actually go swimming in is. So in response to this backlash against Hollywood glamour, who was actually catering for this demand for realism from British audiences? Um, and also, why does the answer to that question matter for our broader understanding of emotions in post-war Britain? Well, the answer to that largely resolves around the fact that cinema played a particularly important role in the visual culture of post-war Britain due to its huge popularity. So 1946, which is a year commonly remembered in historical accounts for fuel shortages and for the introduction of bread rationing, real hardship. This year marked the peak of British cinema attendance with audience numbers reaching more than 1600 million. Moreover, um, films made in Britain for a British audience were given more prominence than they had been since the 1920s um, as a result of government quotas to ensure a minimum percentage of films exhibited in cinemas were British. So it's the government trying to kind of support the British film industry. And one of the success stories that emerged from these circumstances was Ealing Studios. So Ealing had been in operation since 1931, and it became quite well respected for innovative documentaries during the Second World War. But it was in the immediate post-war years that the studio produced a series of comedy films that really made their international reputation. And I'm going to talk in detail about the clothes in two of these films. The first, Hue and Cry, 
was a comedy released in 1947 and told the story of a gang of semi-feral working class London children who managed to foil a high level criminal organization. And the second is Passport to Pimlico, which was released in 1949 and tells the story of a London neighborhood so sick and tired of rationing and austerity that it declared independence from Britain. And these films focus on reflecting a more authentic view of contemporary British life than their Hollywood equivalents. Um, and they draw on the lessons that Ealing's cameramen learned while making wartime documentaries in order to create films that, according to the studio's head, Michael Balkan, projected Britain and British character. And the choice of clothes and the way that these clothes are depicted on screen provided a really important way of communicating this shared sense of social realism and British character to audiences. The wardrobe department took great pains to ensure that the clothes they presented on screen were representative of what it was actually available to buy in the shops. Um, they conducted in-depth research in both shops and street markets. And the majority of contemporary costumes, particularly for female characters, were actually items of ready-to-wear sourced from London shops. Um, I think we have to remember that the films we're talking about today were made when wartime rationing was still in force. So in order to make these purchases, Ealing's costume designer, Anthony Mendelssohn, would supply a costume list to the Board of Trade, and he'd receive in return a corresponding supply of clothing coupons so he could purchase the garments. So I think in, in a really real sense, the clothes on screen in these films are really embedded in the austerity cultures of post-war Britain. And this makes them a really interesting source through which to consider how people were feeling about these austerity cultures. So let's get on to the films themselves um, to see what these austerity materialities can tell us about the emotional cultures and emotional regimes of Britain as it emerged from the shadow of war. So first up, we're gonna talk about hue and cry. Um, now, rather than doing an extremely botched job of introducing this wonderful film. Um, I'm going to leave it up to Ealing Studios themselves and I'll show you the trailer instead. So, you're the young fellow that sees visions on the streets of London. What's your name? Joe Kirby, sir. That's right. Detective Inspector Forge has been telling me about you. Started young, eh? Started what, Governor? The EBGBs. We reckon these stories are being used as a code by a gang of crooks. Do you mean that my stories have been uh, distorted by some... Uh, Master criminal. As a means of sending instructions to his... Uh, minion? Without betraying his own identity. Stupendous. All this nonsense about crooks and codes. But it ain't nonsense, Inspector. There's a racket being worked. Really, there is. Here's the code they're using. And you and the boys are going to catch them all red-handed. That's the idea. Making a real big do of it. The Battle of Ballard's War. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, how I loathe adventurous minded boys. Um, so I think, as you can see from that clip, um, Hue and Cry is embedded in the physical landscape of the post-war blitz ravaged city of London. And it's in this setting, this visual reminder of the, the permanent changes that war had caused, that the film uses clothes to explore another change. And that's the changing meaning of class in post-war Britain. Um, so Hue and Cry's story is actually quite a hopeful narrative of honesty and integrity triumphing over the vested interests of a powerful social elite. 
And the extent of the struggle that the children face to bring down a criminal network embedded in London's social and cultural establishment is really reinforced through the costumes. So the child heroes of the film uh, are clothed in distinctly shabby attire. Um, they're dressed in the working class uniform of hand-me-down suit jackets and ties. And this quite motley pack of children appears with various rips in their ill-fitting clothes. So you can see here on the far right, the character of Joe Kirby has these trousers that are far too big for him. And he's next to um, a character who is wearing a dress that's far too small. So it's that kind of incongruous sizing um, is really important. Uh, and these, these ill-fitting, these shabby clothes provide an obvious visual comparison with some of the criminal elements in the film, who are not only neatly dressed in newer clothes, but they're actively fashionable in a way that seems out of place um, and notably ostentatious in this ruined post-war setting. Um, and that purposeful visual comparison can be seen, I think, really clearly in this still from a scene towards the start of the film. So in it, we can see that Rona, who's one of the criminal gang, is waiting in a bus queue with some of the children, and she's right at the back of the queue mm -hmm. here. Um, oh, I think somebody's got... There we go. Lovely. Um, so we can see that, you know, Rona, um, right from her, her very crisp white turban all the way down to her well-heeled peep-toe shoes, she's a kind of model of contemporary high fashion. Um, and her aesthetic is one that nods unashamedly and really quite unpatriotically towards Paris rather than towards more homegrown fashion trends. And this clear visual difference between Rona and some of the other Londoners who are depicted in this street scene demands that the viewer considers why exactly it is that Rona can afford to look so different from everyone else at a time of continued shortages and rationing. So this is a time when the nation was meant to be under shared austerity conditions, implying that these fashions could really only be obtained through the proceeds of criminal greed. There's something fundamentally dishonest about them. Um, but beyond these stylistic references, it's the material differences between how the criminals and the children wear their clothes that I think really cast suspicion on these characters and their self-interested motivations. So in contrast to the children that she's standing with, Rona's clothes look jarringly new. And this is perhaps less to do with their style and more to do with the visual clues that indicate the difference between the new and the well-worn garments. So for example, uh, the, the shoulders of Rona's jackets are smooth whereas the shoulders of the children's jackets are dented where the, the shoulder padding has broken down and shifted around as a result of a long period of wear. Um, and similarly, the, the children's jackets show puckering on the quarters below the lapels. Um, and this is probably a product of shrinkage during washing. Um, and it's something that would be familiar to many members of the audience during this time, that that's what happens uh, with repeated washing of that kind of tailored garment. Um, and I think even, even Rona's shiny heeled shoes contrast with the scuffed and stretched leather of the children's shoes um, and her fine, sheer, smooth stockings stand out against the folds of the coarse wool socks are being worn by the children here. And Hue and Cry's costumes use its, share, its audience's shared understanding of how clothes wear 
over a long period of time and use. In order to subvert certain middle class cultural assumptions and to challenge the audience to reconsider their own prejudiced associations between being well dressed and being respectable. So the, the materiality of the worn costumes worked against the underlying prejudices that many British people felt about the clothes of the working classes, the, the shabbiness of which they interpreted as signs of vulgar and inferior tastes. And conversely, in Hue and Cry, the shabby clothes signify the kind of eminently respectable characteristics of integrity and hard work. So the central hero, who is Joe Kirby, who's pictured here, is frequently shot in close-ups that clearly show the dark dirt marks around his cuffs. And this dirt is gathered from his, his hard work at Covent Garden Market, as well as from the time he spends hanging out with his friends on dusty bomb sites. And it really roots him within the landscape that he lives in. Uh, and it provides a real contrast to that character of Rona again, who's um, always shown wearing a variety of quite bright white shirts and hats that seem to remain crisp and unsullied by the dusty realities of post-war London. And the cleanliness of her clothes distances her from the day-to-day -day struggles of, of many ordinary people, um, who, including people who'd be watching this film, um, who'd be all too familiar with the difficulties of keeping white garments looking fresh in the dirty, dusty city. And I think that in appealing to their material understanding of what it was like to wear clothes in post-war Britain, the film really subtly, but quite powerfully, asks its viewers to reconsider their, their assumptions about which members of society they believed were most likely to make up the criminal class. So the film's concern with taking control of the city back from criminal elements would have likely resonated with a fearful audience, an audience who was used to reading about a perceived crime wave and um, in particular large numbers of petty burglaries in their newspapers. And Hue and Cry challenged the moral panic contained in those media reports that often blamed this crime wave on the real gangs of youths who played on bomb sites. Um, the result, according to the newspaper columnist Molly Panter Downs, of wartime family breakdowns and lack of disciplining father figures. Um, but rather than pointing fingers at these semi feral children, Hue and Cry harnessed these stereotypes within its story, playing off the the understood material meanings of worn clothes to expose the hypocrisy of British society's tendency to turn a blind eye to the criminal behavior of established members of the community simply because they looked respectable. Instead, Hue and Cry used neat new clothes to indicate an association between fashionable excess, self-interest, and morally dubious behavior in a way that echoed much of the government's official austerity narrative, which associated material self-sacrifice with patriotism and concern for the greater good. So you can see um, in the film, there are close-ups of luxurious pieces of clothing, which invite the audience to kind of almost test themselves according to this morality by contrasting these materially attractive objects against the shabby costumes of the heroic youths. Um, so just to give you a couple of examples of what I mean by that, um, 
when the character Joe Kirby pries open a box of oranges to reveal a stolen fur coat. The camera emphasizes the plush depth of the fur in the way that the light reflects off the coat's long hairs. And this visual presentation of the coat's material properties reminded the audience of the soft, smooth feel of this object, evoking emotions of desire that are really abruptly disrupted by the insertion into the shot of Joe's unwashed rough tree jacket. Um, and similarly, when the children foil an, attempt, an attempted hit on um, the, the aptly named fictional department store in Oxford Circus, Riches, uh, the drama of that uh, plays out in front of a fashion display that is stocked full of really expensive evening dresses. And the way that the dresses are lit conveys a tactile sense of the luxury of these garments. Um, it really accentuates the drape and the weight and the sheen of expensive fabrics against the clean marble floors of the department store. And as the camera closes in on one particularly dramatic full length dress in silk satin, this visual pleasure of this shot is disrupted very suddenly by a mouse escaping from underneath the voluminous skirt of this dress. And the mouse is swiftly followed by a grubby child's hand um, and a shabby jacket sleeve. Uh, and I think that the, the lack of regard that this scruffy child shows for the luxury of the dress's fabric as he roughly pushes, pushes it aside, um, is almost kind of chiding audiences members who fail the morality test um, and find themselves distracted from the higher order business of the film's plot by the visual pleasure of the material goods they're enjoying looking at on the screen. And the, the use of worn clothing in Hue and Cry also openly challenged the idea that austerity regulations in post-war Britain meant inequality of material sacrifice. Um, and they showed that money could buy one's way out of austerity. And the contrast between worn and unworn clothing in the film evoke a really raw sense of the material unfairness of persistent class inequalities, um, which run counter to the narrative of social reform and a new fairer post-war Britain. Um, but the film also uses warm clothes to express a hope that real social change is achievable at this time. So something that I find very interesting about the worn clothes in this film is that Hugh and Cry's younger characters actually get noticeably shabbier as the film progresses, inviting viewers to see integrity and honesty in the rips and tears of their well-worn garments. Joe Kirby's journey from daydreaming youth to action hero is not marked by a transformation into a well-dressed young man. Um, it's instead charted in the deteriorating materiality of his crude homemade jumper. So the jumper begins the film visibly aged. It's baggy, it's got this stretched neckline, it's got all these darned holes, but it doesn't actually begin to physically unravel until he starts to make progress solving the crimes. So as Joe cracks the first major clue, a large loose thread appears in his jumper where the knit's been caught on a sharp object. And this thread seems to sort of dangle ever longer in each successive scene until it's joined by a second loose thread as the action climaxes. And he sort of wears these loose threads um, like badges, like medals earned for his laudable ingenuity. 
And in this celebration of the material qualities of old worn clothes, the film invites the audience to think again about the grubby children who colonized the urban bomb sites. And perhaps to interrogate some of the tensions between their own long held prejudices and the more egalitarian society that was supposed to have emerged from the sacrifices of war. Uh, so Hue and Cry's really very overtly moral message of sartorial self-denial um, was fine when it was released in 1947, but it felt increasingly out of touch with the national mood by the time the Ealing Studios came to shoot their next comedy film, Passport to Pimlico. So by 1948, the persistent difficulties of austerity, notably the continuation of rationing and the high cost of living, left many people feeling that life in post-war Britain was a kind of constant struggle. So even after Harold Wilson did away with much official regulation between 1948 and 1949, devaluation of the pound meant that the majority of Britons still felt left behind economically and denied some of life's material comforts. And this is 1949, it's nearly five years after the end of the war. Um, and mirroring this rising public frustration with continued austerity, Ealing films began to introduce heightened moral ambiguity in the way that they used costumes to convey um, emotions and desires. Um, so Passport to Pimlico's plot uh, centers around the discovery of a royal charter in a crater left by the detonation of an unexploded bomb in London's Pimlico area. And this charter details that due to a complex historic land ownership deal, Pimlico is technically not British, but is in fact legally part of Burgundy. Um, and seizing on the opportunity to escape oppressive government regulation, the locals of Pimlico declare themselves as independent Burgundians and enjoy the excesses of unrestricted consumption for the first time in years, um, at least that is until their supplies run out. And Passport to Pimlico offered cinema goers a tantalizing possibility of a return to unbridled consumption in an alternative post-austerity reality. Um, and to give you a little flavor, I'm once again going to share the film's trailer with you. A British passport for Pimlico. Customs and a frontier post in Pimlico. There must be some mistake. No, there's no mistake. It all began during the great heat wave, when the discovery of buried treasure revealed that part of Pimlico was really Burgundy. That might seem unimportant, unless you lived in Pimlico. Legally, this is Burgundy. Head office no longer has any jurisdiction over this bank. This is my bank. Russian books, this is Burgundy. Coupon, this is Burgundy. Your export department. This is Burgundy. Burgundy. So far, so good. But there are complications ahead in Pimlico. Only the Duke himself can appoint a council. I am the Duke of Burgundy. Not to mention serious repercussions in Whitehall. You see, technically, these Burgundians are aliens. Aliens? Well, then it's your pity. Ah, but they're undesirable aliens. It's your pigeon. <laughs> Um, so unlike Hue and Cry, um, you can see that Passport to Pimlico finds hope through a rebellious rejection of um, austerity rules and notions of collective sacrifice. Um, so as I said, by this point, 
in uh, the decade, it had become really clear that while austerity might force people to change their clothes buying habits, its narrative of self-denial had little effect on how people daydreamed about consuming and enjoying fashion. Um, so mass observation surveys from the late 1940s repeatedly suggest that even though rationing encouraged people to buy fewer and better quality clothes, austerity didn't remove the desire to buy and wear and experiment with different fashions. And exciting new clothes were overwhelmingly the item that people most fantasized about obtaining. Um, and Passport to Pimlico used the materiality of costume to evoke the power of this consumer desire in its audience. Um, the consumption of clothing is in fact one of the first signs of the new freedoms enjoyed by Pimlico residents after they gain their independence. So upon hearing the news, the grocery shop assistant Molly, who's pay played by Jane Halton and on the left here, abandons her shop counter and runs to the local dress shop to retrieve a blouse she'd wanted to purchase previously, but couldn't because she didn't have enough coupons. And although the act of purchasing an item without coupons is a visually significant symbol of freedom, the film also draws on the ability of clothes on screen to convey a powerful sensory experience of consumption in order to elicit emotion. Uh, it uses the materiality of the clothes in the shop to evoke sensory memories of the exciting feel of new clothes, which remind the audience of the, the pleasure and the promise of going shopping. And the clothes that Molly rifles through when she's going along through the shop's rack, um, these clothes are made of lightweight patterned cottons and silks and new synthetic materials. And they move easily through her fingers, for this sort of tactile promise that they'd be um, really comfortable to wear. Uh, and the materiality of these lightweight garments provides a really stark contrast to Molly's work overalls that she's wearing. And these are made of a, a really coarse, heavy cotton. And the weight of that cotton is, is even further emphasized by the way that the sleeves are rolled up into really thick, tight bunches. Um, also the fabric of her overalls is aged into a grubby shade of off-white. And the back of her overalls is covered in dirty marks from the day's work activities. And the juxtaposition of these materials on screen, the lightweight fabric and the heavy overalls, uses the implied feel of the lightweight shop garments to equate this coupon-free purchase of a blouse with the promise of an easier and less laborious future. It's fundamentally really quite hopeful. But beneath the, the optimism um, offered by contemporary ready-to-wear. The clothes in the film hint at darker, more conflicted emotions. Where Ealing's wardrobe team use contemporary ready-to-wear fashions to root the films in the present, the incongruous materiality of placing old clothes in contemporary settings could also be used to create a sense of unease by confusing the audience's expectations of what they thought they should be seeing. While the Ealing Studios productions we're discussing um, provide plenty of visual clues that remind the audience of the film's contemporary London settings, um, everything from the dates that are visibly printed on newspapers to the places mentioned on billboards, the costumes on the screen often challenge and confuse the temporality of the films. Much like the layers of London's built history that were exposed by bombs in the Blitz, the presence of old out of state costumes on screen dug up and exposed a version of the past 
that intruded quite unwelcomely on the present. And the mobile nature of the bodies on the screen mean that these reminders from the past can arrive in the present really quite suddenly and without warning in a quite unnerving way. Um, so although it's, it's, it's largely remembered as a tale of resistance and community spirit, Passport to Pimlico's darker anti-authority sentiment is encapsulated in its use of out-of-date military dress to ridicule and undermine establishment systems and the regulations that stem from them. And these military costumes are worn in strange combinations and in odd settings to muddle the audience's understanding of socially accepted power structures and hierarchies. Um, and I think perhaps the most powerful and ridiculous example of incongruous military dress comes in the form of the makeshift uniform worn by the local policeman, PC Spiller, after he's taken on the role of Burgundian passport control officer. So the policeman Spiller has traded in his official police uniform for a uniform that looks to be improvised from part of his daily wardrobe, um, combined with a shirt and a British Woolsey pattern helmet of the type worn during the North Africa campaign, um, which we sort of are led to presume are remnants from his military service. And the audience would have understood that this desert uniform was not only utterly out of time, but jarringly out of place in a London tube carriage. And the skewed nature of its effect serves to really undercut any claim that PC Spiller has to authority. Um, so the uniform is sloppily worn and it's ill-fitting. The tie is hanging carelessly to the side um, and that reveals uh, the shirt gaping where it's stretched by Spiller's rounded stomach, kind of suggesting that perhaps he's physically let himself go somewhat since the end of the war. Um, and this uniform, which was once a material symbol of, of patriotic wartime service, has become something of a joke. And it's a joke made at the expense of official authority figures, um, likely resonating with audience members who had also personally served. Uh, so, so contrary to many of the narratives told about the hopeful and politically engaged mood of the late 1940s, the war actually left many members of the public quite disengaged from the political process and quite cynical about the motives of all politicians. Um, and in fact, evidence suggests that those most deeply affected by the war, including servicemen, and those living in heavily bombed areas like London, were, li were liable to be actually some of the most cynical um, about authority. And I think Ealing's use of military fancy dress provides a subtle um, and quite humorous means of communicating that mistrust of authority that resulted from that cynicism. Um, the film also incorporates non-military items of wartime costume, uh, which are first seen at the moment when the documentation about Burgundy is discovered and the prospect of independence raises its head. So the shopkeeper, Arthur Pemberton, and his daughter, Shirley, here, uh, they put on their old tin helmets in order to explore the crater that's left by the exploded bomb. And these Zuckerman helmets would have been instantly familiar to the audience as they'd been standard wartime issue for civil defense personnel, such as fire guards and ARP wardens. Um, and Arthur's helmet, as you can see here, is even painted with the letters PW, uh, indicating his mid-ranking wartime service as a post warden. Um, and I think this is a, a bit of a subtle dig at his inflated sense of self-importance that's reminding him of that middle ranking. Um, and I think Shirley's helmet is also really interesting um, because of the way that she struggles to keep this very heavy object balanced on her head in the film. 
um, and she has to fasten it very tightly um, with its chin strap in order to stop it slipping off. Uh, and I think actually many audience members would really have empathized with the clear discomfort of wearing this cumbersome object due to their own material memories of wearing these ill-fitting helmets during the war. Um, and this may well have evoked embodied memories of the emotions they associated with civil defense duties during that frightening time. But the heavy materiality of the helmets, um, particularly Shirley's, is also juxtaposed with the lightweight civilian summer clothes um, and the, the reflective qualities of its dull dented metal contrast with the shine of Shirley's newly painted nails, um, mixing those material memories of the past with a more modern and tactile understanding of the presence. And the effect of this is overall quite comic, but I think also the scale of these remnants of unpleasant wartime memories and an unpleasant wartime past um, means that they are a really inescapable provocation to the audience. They remind the audience of the length of time that has elapsed since the end of the war. And they remind them of the continuing distance between the promises made by the wartime government about a bright future and the darker realities, the limitations and the frustrations of their post-war lives at a time of acute shortages. So as I hope that I've been able to demonstrate a little bit um, today, reading the details of these film costumes from Ealing Studios Productions and considering how they communicate shared embodied experiences of post-war clothing demonstrates that the presentation of clothes on screen did much more than just support the narrative that was being told in the script. Many audience members would have been intimately familiar with the materiality of the clothes that they saw on screen because they frequented the same shops and they owned the same garments by the same brands that were featured in these films. Yet the close-up shots of these garments on a large cinema screen would also have confronted the audience with a strangely hyper-real view of these familiar clothes, prompting them to look again. And I think the, the uncanny nature of this hyper-real visual experience of, of clothes on screen made these costumes a particularly effective tool for evoking emotions in audience members. Um, and as a result, these costumes help reveal um, the complex and, and often contradictory sets of emotions relating to post-war social change and austerity conditions. And I think that the clear presence of feelings of frustration and unease and even mistrust in these films also reflects the politics of their production teams. So Ealing Studios producer Michael Balkan was one of the many British people who became increasingly disillusioned with the post-war settlement in the late 1940s and early 1950s. Um, he was an ardent socialist and Balkan remained politically independent and skeptical of the Labour Party throughout this period and publicly stated that he wanted Ealing to make films that reflected the, the post-war aspirations, not of governments or parties, but of individuals. And Ealing's production teams use the, the intimate bodily nature of clothing as a tool for exploring what it was that post-war individuals actually wanted. Um, and I think it's really interesting to note that a number of Ealing films, including the ones I've touched on tonight, use costumes to evoke material desires in a way that suggests that resistance against Britain's um, entrenched social systems might actually involve personal indulgence 
in some of society's more anti-social impulses. It's a real kind of rejection against that notion of collective sacrifice and community um, stemming from that. So although these Ealing comedies are often quite nostalgically remembered today as stories of community and patriotism and collective sacrifice, their costumes show us that they also provided space for audiences to navigate some of their more conflicted feelings about the very rapid social changes that they were living through. So uh, they were a space to negotiate their experiences and their feelings towards a deeply changed environment uh, and a deeply changed society and social rules. And they provided a space for people to mourn what they'd lost and what people feared that they were going to lose in the changes brought about by post-war modernity. Uh, and for me, it's this ability of clothes on screen to simultaneously elicit multiple and sometimes contradictory emotions in the dark of the cinema that enables them not only to provide an insight into the way people feel and have felt about their clothes, but also to provide an insight into the way that clothes can be used as a tool through which we navigate difficult feelings, both individually and as a society. Um, thank you very much for listening to me and indulging me uh, talking about some of my favorite films there. So I'm just gonna stop sharing my screen um, and see if anyone's got any questions. Thank you very much, Bethan. Um, I'm just going to uh, stop the recording. We don't rec record the Q&A session.